Marina Grisnik es filósofa teórica artista, vive en, en Ljubljana, Eslovenia, y trabaja entre Ljubljana y, y Viena. Eh, desde el año 2003 es profesora a cargo del estudio de arte conceptual, de prácticas de arte postconceptuales en la Academia de Bellas Artes de Viena. Ha estado involucrada en videoarte desde el año 1982 y en colaboración con Aina Smith ha producido más de 30 proyectos de videoarte, un, un cortometraje y numerosas instalaciones de, de vídeo y media instalaciones. Su trabajo teórico ha sido publicado en numerosas eh, ediciones y da conferencias alrededor de, del mundo. Eh, os dejo con, con Marina. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I have it. Okay, super. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation, Maite, uh, Alicia, Pablo. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, I will try to uh, develop some thesis uh, on the topic that I uh, titled Memory and History, the Act of Remembering. I want to come to the archives by through a certain uh, story or a certain uh, path that I want to develop. Uh, so um, what is my proposal as an answer to this title that is a well, as well a rhetorical question? And the rhetorical question is memory and history and the act of remembering that is crucially connected also with the question of the archive. As how to think the act of remembering Uh, when in neoliberal global capitalism we see deep changes of the basic modernist concepts that uh, we are still using freely and unchanged these days. This is what is memory, history, remembering. These are modernist concepts. So I have an answer and I titled this answer Performing the Archives of Amnesia. But you will see this is pretty a paradoxical answer. Um, why I use this performing the archives of amnesia? Because it's also connected with a certain research that we started with a group of researchers in Vienna precisely this year on these questions, what means archives and what means amnesia, because amnesia is connected with remembering. Uh, uh, you have an amnesia and then you try to remember the things and come actually to memory and history. I can state uh, I can state this as well uh, as what we see all around us in this time of neoliberal global capitalism is that uh, we are increasingly confronted with a political and social amnesia that profits uh, practically because it's not having the past uh, while producing more and more processes of dehistorization and depoliticization. So if it's a mathematic that was presented by, Ma uh, by Maite, let's think about uh, politicization of this mathematics, uh, to think about the politicization of that uh, fractal elements inside the archive. Uh, what uh, we have uh, uh, practically is uh, the whole process of uh, uh, forgetting. Uh, central uh, to these processes is the logic of neoliberal repetition that produces at least two different procedures of dehistorization. De It means that the question of uh, losing historicity is not actually a unilateral process. On one side, uh, uh, we have the logic of the neoliberal Western world that works as a pure transhistorical machine. The Western world is, let's say here, we are in this Occident, and uh, on the other, uh, in the region in the East and in the South of Europe, we detect the force techniques of embracing historization as totalization. So in one part we have a trans, something on the other side, on the other, in many of former Eastern European countries we have a totality that is imposed. In both cases, uh, we have uh, the result is a suspension of history that works with a primary intention to dispose of any alternative within it. And actually, Achille Membe, 
uh, looking to these uh, processes suggest uh, that is necessary to do something in order actually to recuperate a history. He says, demythologizing whiteness as the demythologizing of certain versions of history must go hand in hand with the demythologizing of whiteness. What is whiteness? Whiteness is a regime, a regime of power, and we are all part of this, uh, at least in the European context, those who are on power. Member says also, this is not because whiteness is the same as history though it's all the time playing that is the history. Human history, by definition, is history beyond whiteness. Human history is about the future. Uh, though to talk about amnesia is as well paradoxical, as we live in a time, at least in the Occident, of hyper-digitalization. Digital archives are more than just prostheses. Therefore, the capacity to remember seems as a human function almost outdated. This is what we have. This we have all this digitalization. We are not capable to remember. Digital archives do the job instead of us. Therefore, we, see, we as well, uh, therefore, we see that uh, amnesia is as well part of a vocabulary that belongs to an old modernist time and archive as well. Instead, we have digitally enhanced repositories. Uh, because of this, I can also uh, think about uh, uh, what is the status of this archive. And also I can ask a question uh, that uh, uh, digital technologies uh, in the era that we live, in this information age, uh, age and uh, through financialization of economy is also making a big impact on the archive. The digital archive has another kind of function. Uh, important is also that uh, uh, to ask, due to these relations and to these changes, is the relation in between memory and history the same as yesterday's? Is the archive the same as yesterday? Or that is as well my proposal, we should think in all three cases that means when we talk about memory, when we talk about history, when we talk about the archaic, about entirely different apparatuses that require new concepts, or better to say, new reconceptualization. I will call this political reconceptualization. To say this is connected with a thesis that all the notions that we use in a time of neoliberal global capitalism, and specifically because of the intervention of digital media and technologies, we have to rethink deeply anew. Therefore, I want to explain these changes and situate memory and history, amnesia and archive within them. That means within global capitalism. I, of course, depart from something that is, I hope, already present in the space of theory and critical thinking. And this is actually uh, one fundamental change that I call historical. It concerns two different ways connected with capitalism, how to govern over life. Basically, uh, we have actually uh, the uh, one governing of life uh, that is a connection, bet a connection between life and politics, and we call this biopolitics. Uh, this uh, biopolitics is, of course, connected to Michel Foucault in the 70s, talk about biopolitics when he actually talk and make a designation of different peculiar mechanisms that are connected, connected to life, and also they are connected with the organization of knowledge and power and with uh, relations to different political techniques. In the 70s, when uh, 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 practically 
Foucault is talking about these processes, uh, he uh, uh, it's uh, trying or um, it's uh, the idea from my point of view to think how we can define this biopolitics because the biopolitics is historical, is from the 70s. So reading um, reading um, uh, uh, Foucault, it came out uh, that uh, it's possible in a very simple way uh, to think about biopolitics. And uh, the way uh, how uh, he talk about or what is coming out about life, geopolitics, is something as a formula. I say uh, that uh, Foucault is actually uh, defining biopolitics very simple. Make live and let die. Make live, it's actually the 70s, the beginning of the welfare state. And I make in my text uh, a point that definitely this is not the time of the Francoist Spain. The 70s is different. This what uh, 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 Foucault is writing, he's talking about actually the developed Occident. This is the time after the Second World War. And when he said make leave, he talks about the facilities that are done by the Occident for those who are seen the citizens of this Occident. Uh, what stay outside is let die. And let die means an abandonment. Let die is the first, uh, uh, it's actually the former Eastern Europe. It's all the other parts of the world, the famous third world that was used in that time of geopolitics. Uh, make a welfare state for the real citizens, nationals, and not the migrants. This is very important. And let die for all the others, including the East, in the time of the Cold War. But uh, uh, 15 years ago, in 2003, uh, Achille Membe, with a text called Necropolitics, uh, coined actually a new status of biopolitics. Uh, he is talking about necropolitics, I will say, as a radicalization of biopolitics. Uh, 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 in certain way, necropolitics uh, is coming after the 2001. And as uh, uh, we uh, think and ask what necropolitics means, it's coming out from the, uh, what was the processes that uh, happened after 2001. And this was that uh, uh, practically less and less we see uh, the process of administration of life and more and more we see actually governing over death. So necropolitics means actually a process of governing over death that implicate the military corpus, implicate the military machine, and we see this palpably after 2001 working all around and also working in Europe. So, if I said uh, that biopolitics means make live and let die, necropolitics, we see a big change. It means actually let live, a pure abandonment and make die. Let live means actually the new status of uh, global capitalism and the moment that we live, that means uh, practically the welfare state is disappearing more and more. And make die means the implication of the military machine that is more and more present, not only in the Middle East, not, on, not only in Africa, but all around us. So we see to completely different way of managing life. And I repeat, though necropolitics was coined in the African context, it's something that is also working in the European context. We see this palpably in relations to the refugees. And the difference is from make live to let live. Let live is a pure abandonment, not to speak about let die and make die. Let die was actually something let there, left in another part, but make die means the implication of the military machine. Uh, so what I want to say, why I actually uh, put uh, these uh, uh, modes of life, governing over lives, uh, administering death uh, as central to understand the difference between uh, memory, history and the archive. 
Basically, the last decades show that neoliberal global capitalism historically, in order to progress, not only did away with the Berlin Wall that nobody think about that was in 1989, and it will be now almost 30 years next year, but intensified a rupture in the modes of its proper established governmentality. It's actually important to state that what we have in front of us is a shift from biopolitics and necropolitics, and even more their consist coexistence here and now. So it's not like in the modernist type that one situation is before and then something else is coming. Biopolitics and necropolitics, these two fundamental ways of how to govern over life are today present here and now. They share the space. Rubbing the shoulder, so to say, shows that contemporary biopolitics through systematic management of big data, austerity programs, and general emissarization of the biopolitical po population produces a violence that was once reserved for those seen as not enough or fully human. So these processes are actually working now in the European context and not anymore just outside of Europe, that means in Africa, in the Middle East and in other parts. Therefore, if biopolitics is a systematic uh, governing of life of the population, then necropolitics is much more than this, is attached to the whole system of life that is now subjugated to death as capitalization, austerity, exploitation, and also the exploitation not only of the humans, but of the ecosystems. Biopower that is centered on the body uh, of a single citizen is now shifted to a necropower that is more than just targeting the bodies. It targets the whole space or escape to the point we see a switch from biopolitical populations to necropolitical deathscapes. So we have a completely new element of time and space. It's not just about the population, it's about a whole scenery around us. The most important element of this shift is that it's not just a division and differentiation, but is established along the colonial racial divide. We see this clearly if we think about the refugees and the life that we have in Europe. Also about the processes of governmentality, of the way how uh, to work and deal uh, with the refugees and to expel them from Europe. So my thesis is that all what we theorize these days regarding the status of refugees and asylum seekers, including citizenship, that is very important in the Spain context these days, and conditions for a better life has to be seen through necropolitical lenses. The, this necropolitics is actually something imposed over the biopolitics. More, it is important that necropolitics functions through measures of an intensified racialization. No racialization, not to be rational, but to actually structural racism, racialization. This is not just the old racism, but new forms of exploitation, expropriation, and dispossessions of people, states, and as well histories and vocabularies. And last but not least, labor, we are the constructed category of race that is today a norm. This fundamental changes presents it itself in several other passages. And these are the passages that I am listing here. From liberalism to neoliberalism, from multiculturalist capitalism to global capitalism, from administration of life uh, toward the administration of death, and from a change in the first capitalist world of imperial nation states to militarized both state powers. These changes are key in my interpretations to come to history, memory, and archive, if we want to be precise, and maybe also a little bit boring. That means if we want to develop a certain context, how to talk about these things. 
Also, its other changes, from colonialism into a contemporary colonial matrix of power, that is actually a present conditions of coloniality, so not only the historical colonialism, as well a change of a reappearance of two forms of power. And this is actually the most key element that we have today in this shift from biopolitics to necropolitics, besides all the changes that I listed. And this is actually the shift from governmentality to sovereignty, because governmentality and sovereignty, though historically they were part of different uh, system of reproduction, they are actually present today even more. Sovereignty decides over governmentality. It's also other kind of changes uh, that maybe to just name uh, definitely is that uh, the questions of fascism that is reappearing in Europe and uh, the change is that uh, the former Eastern European countries are more functioning like a turbo fascist uh, countries. That means the uh, wild nationalism implemented in that context is actually producing a very peculiar form of historical fascism that is turbo, like all the changes. But the West or the Occident, uh, um, it's also not immune to fascism that we see very presently. And actually, Santiago Lopez Petit talked about, about another form of fascism. He talks about postmodern fascism. And we here in these territories, because when he was developing this, he was relating to Spain as well and to other Occidental states. Uh, this uh, postmodern fascism is actually uh, a, 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 in difference to former Eastern European countries, a fascism that functions with pure deregulations and individualization. Actually, it's a function and resist on the mobilization of something that is called the absolute rejection of the other. And the other are all those who are not seen parts of the nation body. So they are refugees, they are migrants, they are second and third citizens, and this is the characteristic of postmodern fascism. Along this, uh, uh, also to this, is the change in agency from the modernist notion of a political subject toward a citizen. This is also a peculiar uh, redefinition because subjectivity is a key for the way how we think about agency, especially the political uh, subject. It's something that we actually establish all our theories. But what we see today is actually that the political subject, the idea of the notion of political subject is becoming more and more outdated. Everybody just talk about the citizens. Uh, this is why the emancipatory potential is given to an almost old but reborn politics of managing the city, while the state is seen in such a relation being corrupted, hegemonic and militarized. The questions that is to be asked in all these stories about political subjectivity and the citizen is, where are the non-citizens? Where are the migrants? Because the citizens has the power now. They are organizing the police, they are making the things, they, have, they feel empowered or they think that they are empowered. But where are the non-citizens and where are the migrants? So in neoliberal times, we have two machines of power working at the same time. Uh, practically all the time, I try to present this differentiation. I talk all the time about different, but not binaries, but actually a division of notions that we were taking as granting from the modernist time. Uh, in this, we see a fundamental orientation from the figure of agency, from subjects to citizens. Sovereignty decides on the depth of these human subjects that knows very well to claim their humanity historically, but they are not citizens. So the non-citizens are out of these stories. 
and actually they are seen again as redundant. Governmentality is today in a direct relation to biopower and is relegated as a political force to citizens that have now a full right to govern the city as in sort of travesty of the Greek police. The question is that in this change from subjects, political subjects to citizens, without the non-citizens, is actually a question if we have a political management, if we have a political decision, if really politics is what is present in the societies uh, that uh, are part of the European context, and mo mostly I think about the European Union. I propose a further thesis, and this is another, and this is the genealogy of governmentality and sovereignty after the Second World War. In Foucault, governmentality and sovereignty are separated. That means what? Governmentality is the managing of the uh, social body, it's about the welfare state, uh, and uh, sovereignty is seen something that is from the old time. And so Foucault, when he develops uh, his bi biopolitics, he cannot think, he just divides these two poles. Political power is out, only what matters is the governmentality. George Agamben, that comes after Foucault, in the 90s, it's actually uh, talking about the conflation of the biopolitical and necropolitical. He's talking about abandonment and the ban. He's talking, he see that the 90s, though the fall of the Berlin Wall happened, practically is not uh, bringing what was the idea of the global world, but is bringing another way of managing the society, and this is more and more the processes of abandonment and also of the ban. The ban is very clear when we think about the migrants or about the refugees, and it's not strange that actually the migrants that were living decades in different nations start to actually ask for their rights because they are banned from the uh, uh, civic space. But in Achille Membe, uh, practically this is the big change of necropolitics, governmentality and uh, 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 the sovereignty are coming together. They are projected onto each other and also they are simultaneously duplicated. And I repeat, what we have these days is not just a passage or a past of certain terms, but they coexist. The only thing is to understand how they exchange and how they work simultaneously together. Or to be even more schematic, because I think that the genealogy is connected with history. Genealogy is this artificial history, to think our not so distant past and to understand how actually we found ourselves where we are. But what was actually the processes uh, that were in the last decades developed? So Foucault, uh, it's actually putting centrally governmentality. Giorgio Agamben, the night is sovereignty. And Membe takes both at the same time. Though now governmentality in neoliberal global capitalism is overdetermined by sovereignty and also it's both of them being present fully and working in this moment. Why is this important? Why is actually the question of sovereignty uh, coming back and what this sovereignty actually defined in difference to governmentality? As I said, Foucault biopolitics and governmentality is about managing the life, welfare state, giving, uh, uh, taking care, but also restricting uh, the population in order that uh, is giving a certain level of life, health, education. Sovereignty that we have as a new way of governing, a new way of administering, and it's not anymore connected with life, but with death, is actually connected precisely with uh, this uh, postulate. Practically, sovereignty decides who should live and who must die. And we see again this all around us. 
That means who will be actually put outside of the European Union, who will have a certain social benefit, who will actually be uh, put outside of the social benefits of the city police, who will exercise the role of being a citizen, who will be the non-citizens waiting to be expelled from the police, so this is actually what sovereignty does, and this is the function of sovereignty, and this factor, who should live and who must die, is today superimposed onto the management or administration of life, onto governmentality. But governmentality and uh, sovereignty, they coexist. So when we get some benefits, uh, we have to ask also who actually was left out of these benefits that we had, because some are actually push, push to such a margin that they are already ready to die, or they will be abandoned to such an extension that sooner or later they will actually die. So, uh, coming to, to this trajectory, to these shifts, uh, sovereignty, governmentality, the questions of fascism, the question uh, historically turbo-fascism, um, postmodern fascism, war state, nation state, all these shifts are part of the time that we live and they are all uh, practically possible to trace historically. Uh, finally, I come to this point now, how to think about amnesia, about memory and history. Uh, one, uh, one of the pos possible ways is, of course, again, uh, to, work, to think in a, a genealogical way. So to establish an artificial history of these relations. What is the relations between memory, history, and finally about the archive? Uh, in the 70s, working through theory and critical thoughts, we see uh, the imposition of what I can term a biopolitical amnesia that is not seen as a rationalizing process of forgetting, but it presents a deficit in memory. Practically, in the 70s, it's uh, the time to deal with how the biopolitical space work with uh, uh, memory and history is connected with amnesia. So all the time, it's of, uh, the situation of the impossibility to remember. It's uh, the process of the impossibility of remember, it's actually very well captured by this term of amnesia. Uh, so, uh, when we say performing the amnesia is to make evident these processes of rationalization, not ra rationalization, though structural racism is connected as well with rationally structured violence. When I said that my answer is uh, to the question that is rhetorical, memory and history and the act of remembering, and I say performing the archives of amnesia, means actually to think how amnesia in the 70s can be performed in order to develop a certain genealogy of these processes. But... Uh, if for the 70s we see a process of uh, incapability of remembering this question of amnesia, the 90s, due to these shifts from biopolitics slowly toward necropolitics, actually shows, uh, and this is after the Berlin Wall, another kind of a notion. We see first an abandonment of uh, many of the terms, but also we see a way of dealing with his history and memory. And this process is possible to term aphasia. Uh, Anna Laura Stoller uh, writes in uh, her text, Colonial Aphasia, Race and Disabled History in France, that practically what is going on in the 90s when talking and thinking about the colonial past of uh, France is that uh, uh, France or the French Republic cannot connect the question of republic with the empire. Practically, aphasia means what? Missing the words. Or 
Aphasia means when it's a psychological also a situation, is a traumatic situation. When you see, you learn, but you cannot express anymore or you cannot understand what actually it was said. So it's not just it's an, as in amnesia that you cannot remember. Now the things are in front of you, but you cannot connect them. And this is how actually the 90s in the uh, analysis of Anna Laura, uh, Anna Laura Stoller actually function in the relation of memory and history. So practically what I want to show is that the process in which we come today, where we don't have history anymore, it's practically something that is already going on from the 70s as a historical process, but that the formats of this uh, uh, way of losing history or actually f history that is sized, that is captured, that is actually confined, is uh, coming through different ways of how this process was going on. So from, from amnesia to aphasia and I come, uh, also, uh, if I uh, talk about a uh, little bit more what Anne Laura Stoller is saying, uh, she said, Colonia, colonial aphasia is invoked to supplant the notion of amnesia or forgetting. So in the 90s, is not anymore just about not remembering, but is actually about this aphasia and how this function what are the characteristic, characteristics of this aphasia? First, an occlusion of knowledge. Second, a difficulty generating a vocabulary that associates appropriate words and concepts with appropriate things. This is what is going on when you talk about colonialism. It's passé, what was this, who? Why? What well, this is passé? Why we are talking about colonialism? This is how it's just a kind of short circuit. And third, a difficulty comprehending the enduring relevancy of what has already been spoken. Books are written, things are said, but practically they are just without any redundance. And now we come in 2017. Uh, making um, a, an analysis what is going on in 2017, it's very interesting the book that was published by Marie Jose Monza because she published a book in which uh, she uh, the title of the book is um, Confiscation of Words, Images and Time, and she already implies in this book, that is a very recent uh, analysis, that practically what we have today, what we see is a whole process of what she calls confiscation. It's like different words are put in prison. They are actually put under key. We don't, uh, we have no a chance for use them. And uh, practically she exposed one word uh, that is um, very key, and this was the word of radicality. She says that today, because of what's going on with terrorism, we cannot use the word radical anymore. Radicality is such a word that is confiscated. But of course, she's writing the book because she wants to say that we have to get back certain vocabularies and we have to get back certain processes. Even more, uh, she is saying economic liberalism has uh, sized our vocabulary. So the process that we see today from amnesia to aphasia is actually a process of a seizure. It's actually a moment where our history and memories are put into prison. They are confiscated. They are sized to the point that we absolutely don't have them, specifically history. She also insists uh, that because of this, 
uh, we have actually uh, to think uh, differently. Everybody is talking about de-radicalization, but she is saying what is the outcome of this de-radicalization, the demand not to use the word radicality. She said what we get in the end it's actually another dream. And this is the dream to return to order and health. And listen, order and health sounds very similar to certain historical process. Fascism is definitely one of these. So she calls for a different perspective. Not only must we not emerge from the crisis, but rather we must intensify it in its radicality so as to deploy all creative resources and mobilize all revolts in order to bring forth the figure of another world. What is that we have today after amnesia and aphasia? Seizure is co-substantial with necropolitical racializing assemblages. It presents a confiscation and therefore an absolute erasure of counter-cultural political histories. This will be the genealogy that I think is key for us to understand why we talk about memory and why we talk about history, though we are losing actually history and memory. Or I will maybe have another thesis just very soon in the end of this presentation. But what is important is the 70s is connected with amnesia, the 90s with aphasia and 2017 with seizure. This is why we have to perform the archives of amnesia in order to come to a certain way to see what is the necropolitical seizure of history. Because why? Amnesia is actually something that belongs to the past. Performing amnesia, the process of remembering, actually gives us the possibility to understand what is that is confiscated today. What is that is actually taken and not make accessible to us when thinking about history. Uh, what all this implies is actually another shift that uh, uh, was uh, pretty clearly defined by Mark James Leger because he is saying that maybe uh, we have to, in order to understand these processes, we have to abandon cultural, the cultural politics of representation that is definitely connected with uh, postmodern cultural studies and actually try to think for radicalized constituent politics. What this means, means actually to uh, engage in the question of history and memory, building what is possible to say a new way of community through uh, uh, politics that actually constitute the community and not just represent an image of what is the status of the community. In the process of imposed failed modes of remembering is definitely connected with the perception also of time. Necropolitical seizure is immobilization and fundamental negation of time. Or Membe, Achille Membe says, negation of time that is colonial point of view means being without history. And this is what we actually have. So we have also, because the history is taken, we have also a completely different dimension of time. So these implications to talk about memory, history and archive has absolutely fundamental changes on the perception of time and also on space. Because if you don't have history, then you are actually uh, with, in a, a kind of a status quo. And if you have no uh, uh, time, you also are immobilized in the space. So you don't have a mobility to pass from one to another. Uh, being radically located outside of time or to connect on the repetition uh, it's a repetition without difference. Because if we have no history, we have no difference, we have no an possibility. A native time was sheer repetition. 
And this is why Membe talk, when he's talking about uh, this question, he's talking about the time of colonialism. So not of events as such, but of instantiation of every law of repetition. Fanon understand decolonization as precisely a subversion of the law of time. Uh, the way of how history is foreclosed by processes of racialization changes regarding the changes of capitalism after the Second World War, reproducing the relations in between governmentality and sovereignty. So, sovereignty is this seizure. Sovereignty means actually this uh, taking or uh, the question of uh, confiscation of history. Therefore, through procedures of racializing assemblages imposed onto counter history in the 70s, present uh, in the 70s uh, through a bio biopolitical amnesia, that is forgetting, the 90s as imposed uh, abandonment and ban as a form of aphasia, we come to a moment. Uh, that uh, it's possible to say that is a moment of uh, seizure or a p complete confiscation of histories. In 2017, we see that we face with our archives, uh, and uh, in relation to our archives, uh, we see a necropolitical sovereign seizure of confiscation or confiscation, a complete privatization of communal counter histories by those on power, from the state repressive apparatuses to all sorts of cultural, artistic, archival, political, and economic institutions. This is actually the moment that we have. Uh, therefore, I connect what I call necrocapitalist sovereignty uh, uh, practically with the management of the human through seizure, confiscation of countercultural, political, and social histories. Why are these counter histories uh, uh, so important? Because without counter histories, it is not possible to reclaim the present. So, this moment of seizure, this moment of conf confiscation, is something that actually um, uh, immobilized and prevent uh, many of the actions for a change. Therefore, performing the archive of amnesia means nothing else than the demand to understand that we face a moment, time, a moment in time where the notions of archive and amnesia are altered radically. They are almost too old or too human. This is why, as I said, when I start, I ask if actually the archive are even, uh, so to say, not part of something that is part of the past, because of these processes that actually put under question the capability of memory and history. And maybe the last question, what is that is uh, in the last distance going on with history and memory? because this is not the end of the story. Uh, one of the answers that I'm giving is uh, connected uh, also with the status of the institutions, uh, and this is that practically the institutions of art, as uh, we talk a lot about financialization of capital, are also by themselves showing an unbelievable uh, financialization processes. I call this the financialization of cultural institutions. Uh, this financialization of cultural institution is actually an empty rhetorical process of all the time just producing information. I have, uh, this is quite an important point because this financialization, this emptying is connecting also with memory and history. Uh, practically, we can say that uh, uh, this is connected uh, with the situation that today history is gone, almost not existent, and maybe only what stays is the biopolitical possibility to have a certain individualized memory. So this is also the difference between memory and history. And uh, with this, I would like to finish. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Marina. Um, si tenéis uh, preguntas, if you have questions for Marina, we have like some minutes now. So if anyone is interested in asking something to her, tenemos un, un micrófono por aquí, si alguien... Uh, um, if there is no one that is interested in asking you, I would like to ask you about this idea of the um, digital archive as a protesic memory and so on, because you know, trying this idea of trying to get the theory into the real practice of archiving and so on. In terms of this idea of making difference between which is relevant and which is not relevant to keep in an archive, how to deal with this hyper archival digital stuff? You know, like the archival stuff is not. You know, it's not the sacred space and the profane space anymore. It's like a huge space full of also like shitty information. So how to deal as, a, as an archivist with this idea of the protestic memory in the, in the digital archive? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think uh, that uh, in a certain way, uh, the uh, archive uh, in this historical meaning is actually a very old notion as I try to uh, also, uh, as I imply, so uh, that uh, uh, the, um, the digitalization of the archive, archive is actually producing an absolutely new status of the way how uh, the information, it's, it's actually a certain artificial uh, but uh, uh, very powerful extension of the old notions of the archive. And in order uh, to give an answer, definitely uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the role of the archive was always the role in relations to uh, the question of history, how, because through the archive, the, the way how we accessed the archive in that uh, all the modernist uh, archaeological ways, it was uh, because actually to produce uh, history, to get uh, a possibility uh, to give a narration to history. But uh, as I uh, try to show uh, the question uh, and the implications of necropolitics uh, today uh, practically uh, um, made um, a confisc confiscation of history. So, uh, the, uh, not in, in this way, uh, the, the main goal of the archive in, uh, and the main goal why to have history uh, change radically. Because uh, the question is what we actually search and what we will get from this artificial extension. What actually kind of narratives we want to uh, produce? Is the narratives, uh, narrative from the digital as archive or uh, through the access to the digital archive uh, connected just uh, with a fractal, uh, so to say, um, almost uh, very uh, kind of uh, spectacular uh, re, um, uh, finding one missing data, or we actually um, uh, try to, uh, to make an analysis uh, uh, through the archive in order uh, to uh, think or to develop uh, another perspective of history. And I, mean, and I think uh, this is really a clash because more or less uh, uh, it's uh, just uh, um, a kind of uh, individual, uh, it's like a fetish. You find something, uh, one details, but uh, uh, what is missing is that the whole, st the possible narration of a history is actually uh, put in prison. History is uh, seen as absolutely, uh, in a certain way, uh, not relevant and to this element of this detail is also connected the question of memory, as I said. So in the time where we have all these digital uh, processes, in the time where we talk about an unbelievable uh, pr uh, produ production of information, we see that what is allowed is just the biopolitical uh, memory. And this memory is very much uh, uh, individualized, and this is very much coming back uh, to the idea that was uh, largely developed that the society in the Occident today 
functions with an unbelievable fr fragmentation that is, uh, uh, I think, uh, very accurately uh, named uh, the postmodern fascism because it's an un un unbelievable fragmentation of the society and to this actually responds also the biopolitical memory because also the biopolitical memory it's something as a personal, uh, so to say, of the a personal uh, recollection of a certain narrative or of the condition of life. Uh, it's a memoir and so on, but history as such. History in terms of the clash, in terms of uh, uh, giving a narration, uh, giving a much wider context, this is really something that is out of any vision in the present moment of neoliberal global capitalism. Pues, no sé si hay alguna pregunta más, y si no pasamos a... Ah, mira, ahí atrás hay una pregunta, sí. Hello, my name is Paulina. I come from Guatemala, Central America. And I would like to ask you if you could shed some light about this sequence of amnesia, aphasia, and seizure in countries like Central America, where actually in the present we can see that it's not a sequence, but it's actually happen happening, the three of them at the same time. And then there's a kind of amnesia that is desirable because of how the state has uh, told the story, which is not actually the story. And then this big aphasia of people that have the story in their bodies mm -hmm. and haven't been able to put it into words yes. and are not able to put it into words. And even though we are f far away uh, from Europe, we are, through technology and globalization, we're being affected by this neo-capitalism. So mm -hmm. this is the question. Yeah, super. Thank you very much because uh, I, I'm a I'm little bit more um, dragged that uh, because you put very clearly uh, what I said, so uh, it's a chance that uh, something will stay with the public. Um, uh, but uh, I want to say that it's very uh, uh, important uh, this moment that you emphasize already, and this is, and that I also emphasize that today we don't live anymore uh, in a certain, uh, I made a sequence, but the sequence are just for us to historically understand uh, um, certain processes and to understand that we cannot just talk about amnesia, because amnesia is already historical, and it's connected, it exists, it's working, it's present, but uh, the, mo the main, uh, uh, so to say, power of, as a notion, as a process, was actually already uh, historical in the 70s and that it's working today also, and it's uh, present as aphasia and seizure, uh, this is because the time of global capitalism precisely uh, work with this uh, all together at, at, at once. So also necropolitics and biopolitics are not only necropolitics reserved for Guatemala and biopolitics for Spain, no way. For Spain is also reserved the necropolitics for those who are here. Maybe they are coming from somewhere else, so they are abandoned and they are actually let to die or let live if you want because you are not a citizen, but still the consequences are present. Though uh, in this, uh, let's say, triadic formulation uh, or genealogy, what matters is that what uh, organize even uh, amnesia and aphasia is precisely the confiscation. So the element of confiscation, the element that we see in life with refugees, with other people put in a special prison, put outside of our eyes, uh, completely, uh, so to say, confiscated or imprisoned in Libya, not to come to, for example, Spain anymore, or in Morocco and other parts of this uh, uh, this uh, process, this, uh, I will say, procedure, 
it's uh, the right word. It's actually a use and, uh, for also other notions that are absolutely maybe not connected with this. So the confiscation, it's the one who is over-determining amnesia and aphasia in a very Althusserian way. Uh, but all of three of them are working, and you explain super, because it's some that cannot remember, the others knows everything, but just doesn't, I mean, their words are, nobody understands what they want to say. They, they talk and they said, what, what we are talking about? But this is passé, or they don't have the word because the words are confiscated. So they cannot even say, if they want to say this, they say, but, oh, you are a terrorist, hop, stop. Yes, so... We 20, 20, in Guatemala we have 23 languages, not dialects, so it becomes even more complex. How can you tell the story when it's only in your body? And they, they're not even, I mean, the indigenous, the different ethnic groups in Guatemala don't have any representation in the state mm -hmm. for 500 years. So it's, it's parallel processes between the present and the past. And but I just want to say also, uh, I had to, to develop all these things because to understand how we come to this, we can only, only understand today with a much larger process. But I want also to say what uh, we could learn from other theoreticians, not coming from Europe, but based in Africa, in Latin America, in Eastern Europe, and so on, that what we see is somewhere else, sooner or later, this is the question of uh, global capitalism is coming in the center. And precisely, you have dialects, then you will have 27,000 demands that will be like a kind of a chaotic uh, scream that nobody will understand. And again, it will be in the concrete space presented as amnesia. We, we heard this aphasia, what these people talk, in the end, they will all actually be immobilized, saying nothing will be asked anymore. So in this way, this history and memory really are um, for us uh, important, because I repeat, the moment that we have the uh, seizure of uh, history and the confiscation of history, we actually are not at the end of history. This is absolutely something different, these uh, 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 stories and narratives that were sold to us. Uh, to, to immobilize uh, history is not actually to be the end of the history, means actually to um, uh, immobilize our possibility for agency. This is not the end, this is the beginning of actually incarceration of those who were thinking they will never face a prison. This is much more, uh, so to say, demanding for us to think. So this will be um. Thank you very much. <laughs>